everyone to log into their CME and text the number uh, 24840 to the number listed in the chat to get your CME credit for this grand rounds. And then it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Justin George, who's an associate professor of vascular surgery at the Mount Sinai Hospital. He received his doctor of medicine from the University of Pennsylvania, where he developed his interest in minimally invasive aortic and vascular interventions. He then completed his general surgery residency at Mount Sinai Health System and served as the general surgery chief resident, where he earned the prestigious Arthur H. Aguffs Jr. MD Prize in Surgery Award. He remained at the Mount Sinai uh, hospital to complete his rigorous vascular surgery fellowship. Um, Dr. George treats the full spectrum of vascular disease using the latest minimally invasive techniques in order to provide the best possible patient care. His clinical interests include the management of aortic disease, peripheral or serial disease, management of deep venous thrombosis, and iliocaval reconstruction. Dr. George has authored numerous peer-reviewed manuscripts on these subjects, presented his research at in multiple international, national, and regional meetings. Most importantly, his wife is one of the ED attendings downstairs with me. And so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. George to give us grand rounds. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for that kind introduction, Evan. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, give this presentation. I know uh, deep vein thrombosis, uh, everyone learns about it, talks about it. And I just wanted to review some of the stuff that we all probably know or have some idea about and kind of uh, uh, talk about um, some of the more modern things that we're doing, especially in the last five years or so, some of these uh, novel uh, minimally invasive endovascular techniques uh, that we've been using to treat uh, specifically iliofemoral uh, DVTs. So as I have said, my name is uh, Justin George. I'm an assistant professor uh, here. I did my general surgery training and uh, vascular surgery training here, and I'm excited to be here to give this grand rounds. So, you know, this uh, picture right here is a combination of some of my own cases and cases of some of my colleagues. And uh, it's called, uh, it's been uh, kind of taking over Twitter and social media, and it's been dubbed uh, clot porn. And uh, you can see why it's kind of astonishing, you know, uh, some of these uh, images, you can actually see the vasculature itself. And this is all thrombus that's been pulled out either in the acute or subacute, or even in some cases, the chronic setting. Uh, and these are all cases of uh, iliofemoral or cable uh, DVT that uh, my colleagues and I have uh, had the pleasure of extracting uh, from uh, patients at this very hospital. Uh, so, you know, this is just kind of a, a shock picture here, and I'll kind of go through the whole process of uh, DVTs, uh, pathophysiology, uh, management, and some of the newer uh, techniques for managing these uh, symptomatic, uh, acute, or even chronic uh, iliofemoral or cable DVTs. So the objectives, uh, discuss the incident scope, uh, the problem, the economic impact, early detection, uh, discuss which DVT patients are at risk for developing certain things. We all know about PE, but something that hasn't really been discussed as much is uh, the other consequence of uh, DVT, which is um, post-thrombotic syndrome, uh, timely and effective uh, DVT treatments and how this can reduce post-thrombotic syndrome and review some of the uh, treatments, techniques, and the outcomes. And uh, I'll share some uh, personal cases as well. So, you know, we see DVTs and the first thing we think of uh, in patients, as, as we should, are, are PEs, but what we don't realize is uh, a lot of these uh, DVTs are diagnosed in the outpatient setting or in the emergency department, and uh, it leads to uh, a tremendous social cost. Uh, there's 2 million workdays lost annually in the United States alone, and uh, there's some studies that uh, kind of annualize the cost uh, in patients who subsequently develop post-thrombotic syndrome, and it's $11,600 uh, you know, annualized for the average person who develops a DVT and develops post-thrombotic syndrome. These are some images here. Uh, in patients who developed acute DVT, was managed uh, with anticoagulation, developed post-thrombotic syndrome uh, afterwards. So some more uh, uh, DVT statistics. It's a common condition. Uh, 482 per 100,000. Uh, we're seeing an increase in the incidence, and that's more probably because you know we have so much more access to ultrasound, which I'll talk about. It's a great test, and we do point of care ultrasound testing. Uh, we see 600,000 cases of significant PE diagnosed a year. A significant portion of those lead to deaths. Uh, typically, uh, we see uh, management of DVTs with anticoagulation, 
you know, either prophylaxis or treatment there. Uh, in most cases, specifically if PE are preventable, especially if we detect the DVT and anticoagulate in time, we can uh, prevent that. So uh, again, a, a brief overview, DVT is thrombus or clot in the deep venous, venous system. It can occur anywhere, but the majority of this talk is really uh, specifying the lower extremity because these are typically the DVTs that can result in uh, you know, life-threatening uh, PE, specifically iliofemoral DVTs. Symptoms include leg pain, swelling, tenderness. Uh, and again, we have a pretty good sense of uh, ordering tests and things when we see unilateral leg swelling. Uh, you know, 50% of patients develop post-thrombotic syndrome afterwards, and I'll talk more about that. And evidence from uh, two major trials, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, the CAVIN trial and the TRAC trial suggest early aggressive intervention, specifically in iliofemoral DVT, to minimize the risk and severity of post-thromatic syndrome. Uh, 50 to 75% of DVT cases are provoked. Uh, you can see all these different risk factors listed here. And in any given uh, ICU patient, they probably have at least five to 10 of these different uh, risk factors. And so I would say any ICU patient is probably at high risk of developing a provoked uh, DVT. We know uh, risk factors classically described in Virko's triad. We have circulatory stasis, you know, immobility, especially after surgery, inflammatory states, you know, Crohn's disease, cancer, things like this, endothelial injury, uh, any type of uh, surgery or uh, in coronary catheterization, anything like this, and then a, a hypercoagulable state, which we can see listed there. And it's these three things that kind of make up this uh, triad of uh, risk for developing a DVT. And uh, this has been long established. There's a Caprini score. Uh, I don't know anyone who actually calculates the score itself, but you can see that there is some clinical utility here. I think um, you know this scoring system is probably less necessary given the ease of access to point of care or even formal ultrasound uh, testing and the high sensitivity of DVTs in there. Uh, we have uh, mechanical prophylaxis, which targets uh, you know the stasis aspect of Virco's triad passive, typically just compression stockings. This has been shown uh, to reduce uh, post-operative DVT. And then active, we have uh, those uh, SEDs that, you know, the nurses are, uh, and appropriately so, uh, vigilant about putting on every possible patient. Uh, it improves venous outflow, but it also induces local fibrinolytic uh, activity and is associated with a decrease in uh, DVT uh, rates. Uh, pharmacologic uh, prophylaxis, you know, there's some studies about aspirin uh, versus low molecular weight, no significant risk uh, difference uh, after a period of time in developing DVT or, or bleeding risk can use, but uh, it's limited data. Uh, Coumadin, again, not really uh, appropriate given the long uh, time to actually reach uh, therapeutic uh, levels. And what we usually do here is either heparin or uh, low molecular weight heparin. Uh, typically 5,000 units Q8 hours or Q12 hours, and reduces uh, DVT incidence uh, by a significant percent there, you can see. Uh, unfractionated heparin is at least as effective as uh, unfractionated heparin. Uh, it has a superior risk reduction uh, for PE, and uh, there's no significant difference in uh, major bleeding. I know there's a big push in the trauma uh, literature for uh, low molecular weight heparin specifically. How do we diagnose DVTs? The symptoms typically can be asymptomatic. They can have unilateral extremity swelling, pain, warmth, or the presentation can really be that of PE and the subsequent workup demonstrating DVT. The signs we see extremity edema. Sometimes if you look closely in a patient you diagnose with a DVT, you can see dilated superficial veins because the blood needs to get out of the leg or the extremity. And when the deep venous system is thrombosed, uh, blood kind of routes into the superficial venous system. You can see that the great saphenous vein and all the varicosities can be especially prominent in the setting of uh, acute or subacute DVT. You may feel a palpable cord. There may be increased skin warmth, pain on palpation, we all know home and sign, you know, flexion of the uh, foot uh, eliciting pain in the uh, calf. Uh, Clinical uh, assessment, severe instances, very rare to see, but we have phlegmasia, alba dolens, uh, that's 
swollen, white, painful limb. Uh, usually that's uh, limited to iliac vein occlusion. And the limb is white because the dermal and subdermal uh, layers uh, still have a clearing of venous blood. Phlegmasia, cerulean dolens, you know, I haven't yet to see a case of this, but um, you know, you have swollen blue painful limb that is a threatened limb. And that's usually an extensive severe iliofemoral DVT. There's really no outflow for the leg, even the dermal and subdermal layers. You can have development of a hemorrhagic boli and progression to venous limb gangrene. Again, very rare, but it is a threatened limb which needs uh, immediate uh, intervention. In terms of diagnosing uh, what tests we can order, uh, duplex ultrasound, we have ease of access to it. Uh, it's really the diagnostic test of choice. Uh, it's not invasive. You have uh, intraluminal hypoepigenicity uh, in the acute setting. You have increased venous diameter, and there's the inability to collapse the vein with the transducer it's itself. Uh, ultrasound, fairly good at uh, determining uh, acute or, or even chronic uh, DVTs. The limitations here is uh, some small percentage of patients have duplicated deep femoral veins or duplicated uh, cable structures, uh, and you may uh, miss that duplicated system if you just identify uh, one vein and, and just follow that one vein. And furthermore, uh, it's difficult to assess the vein in obese patients. And it's difficult to assess uh, the more central venous system, uh, specifically the iliac vein or anything central to that. And uh, those uh, can be uh, you know, quite important when uh, determining you know, if something needs to be done for these patients. Uh, venography uh, is, uh, has been said to be the gold standard. Uh, I don't think it's the gold standard anymore, but basically accessing the vein and shooting some venograms to see if there's any uh, occlusion or, or a thrombus. Uh, CT venography is the CT version. Is sometimes we ask for CTVs of the abdomen and pelvis. And that's really when we want to determine the proximal extent of thrombus. Oftentimes, uh, vascular surgery will be consulted uh, with a new finding of uh, DVT. And we really want to know how proximal does it go. And I'll kind of explain why in a little bit. But CTVs uh, are timed in a way where we can optimize the iliac veins and cava to determine thrombus burden in those regions. Uh, there are some hospitals where, you know, when they do a, a, they have high suspicion for a PE, the timing is such that they can get their uh, CTA to look for PE in the pulmonary arteries and uh, delay uh, appropriately so to then scan the venous system, the abdomen and pelvis to detect uh, iliofemoral DVT. Uh, MR venography is also uh, an option. We usually do this in the outpatient setting uh, and we really, do that to determine not so much DVT, although it can be detected, but to determine if there's any central venous stenosis or occlusion or compression. Uh, the issue is, um, is a big insurance issue to try to get those clear, then it takes some time. Uh, PET CT scans can also be used and it helps differentiate tumor thrombus from you know, uh, acute thrombus. And then uh, the final thing there is uh, intravascular ultrasound is actually ideal. We have a uh, very small, uh, ultrasounds that can be mounted on catheters, a small eight French or uh, nine French catheter. And we can actually visualize the intraluminal aspect of the vein and detect, uh, you know, thrombus compression and things like that. And I would say that's probably the gold standard. Now. But it, again, is a is, uh, invasive procedure. This is a chart kind of distinguishing acute versus chronic thrombus. We have some images here to try to detect the age. This is a uh, you know, you see no compression and compression with the transducer probe. There's no change at all. We don't really see anything in the vein. It's hypoecogenic. This is an acute thrombus here. And, uh, and here's uh, another image uh, looking at the vein. This is with transducer compression. We see the vein completely disappears. This is kind of a true question. There's no DVT identified here at all. This is a normal vein. You should see complete, complete uh, com collapsibility with the compression. And then here we see some echogenic material there. There is some uh, compression, but not fully with uh, compression of the uh, transducer. And in the uh, sagittal view, we see uh, there seems to be some thrombus there, but there is some recanalization, uh, but it's incomplete. This is a chronic DVT. So why do we treat DVTs if there's no phlegmasia? 
we all know decrease the risk of PE. The other thing that I'm going to be talking more about is uh, decrease the, the risk of developing post-thrombotic syndrome. So after acute DVTs, uh, you have a clot in the venous system. Uh, the clot kind of distends the vein, and so the valve uh, is not actually uh, working properly. It's distended. Uh, it takes a long time to clear this thrombus using anticoagulation alone. The valves in the vein can scar, and the vein never really returns to normal. You end up having uh, incompetent veins, so you have uh, venous insufficiency, which can then subsequently result in symptoms like cramping, heaviness, pain. But there's a large spectrum, and I'll show some severe complications from post thrombotic syndrome. Ehlers femoral DVT is the biggest predictor of post thrombotic syndrome, and this is why we often ask for CTVs of the abdomen and pelvis when there's a femoral DVT identified because we want to know, is there any iliac vein extension because those patients benefit most from aggressive treatment. Uh, so kind of going first step-by-step -step medical treatment for DVT. Calf DVTs in the gastroc, uh, we typically anticoagulate to prevent propagation, uh, to prevent propagation uh, and the early complications. Uh, we typically do uh, ultrasound frequency office uh, for femoral popliteal DVT and coagulation. And then iliofemoral DVT, anticoagulation, certainly. But then you can consider interventional therapies to decrease the, the chance of developing post thrombotic syndrome. Uh, the length of uh, anticoagulation provoked DVT is you know, three months typically. Uh, cancer patients in specific situations you may want uh, indefinite uh, anticoagulation. Then uh, if there's a recurrence uh, using any uh, DOAC or vitamin K antagonist, to use low molecular weight heparin. Uh, to medical management, early ambulation, uh, compression stockings here. And uh, of course, if unable to tolerate anticoagulation to prevent PE, we uh, can consider IVC filters. IVC filters is a small kind of branch here. I talk about it was initially uh, invented in the 60s, and the goal was to prevent uh, uh, migration of these uh, DVTs and uh, prevent uh, fatal PEs. Uh, initially, the IVC was surgically ligated, but we've developed obviously you know, much less invasive ways of uh, providing the same protection. Uh, here you can see, uh, a lot of images of uh, different IVC filters. Uh, you can see here in G is actually the IVC filters we use uh, at the uh, hospital. 99% of them are these optional IVC filters. See a little hook there. And we place them. All the filters we place now are retrievable because uh, even if they stay in for a long time, uh, the goal is uh, to eventually retrieve them. There can be some significant complications with long-term IVC filter placement. Uh, the natural history of uh, DVTs, most DVTs recanalize by three months while in anticoagulation, but that's not complete thrombus resolution. Only half have complete thrombus resolution by nine months. And then recurrence is 30% at 10 years. So, uh, um, you know, some... Symptoms of post-thrombotic syndrome, uh, you know, is really chronic venous insufficiency. The valves uh, in the veins become damaged, uh, allows uh, blood to have uh, retrograde flow in uh, settings of uh, severe venous hypertension. Uh, you can see here valvular dysfunction, uh, secondary to uh, proximal obstruction. Uh, and we see that venous insufficiency occurs relatively early in the setting of DVT. 17% of patients at one week, 69% uh, of patients at one year develop post-thrombotic syndrome after DVT. And the degree of initial vein occlusion correlates with the likelihood of developing uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. Reflux in the more proximal lower extremity veins is particularly important. Uh, in the development of post-thrombotic syndrome. So here I have some images uh, to kind of demonstrate how severe this can be. Uh, you see, you know, some itching, cramping, swelling, tingling, uh, but it can get quite severe. You see some images there of uh, varicose veins, skin discoloration. 
and here are some uh, images. You see that severe varicose vein. Uh, if you continue, you can see severe vein ulceration as well. This is all a result not of arterial disease, but simply DVT that results in uh, venous deficiency, venous reflux, and then when venous ulceration can be pretty severe and shocking. Uh, and post thrombotic syndrome, you know, about half of patients eventually develop on anticoagulation alone. But we can risk stratify and kind of determine who is at most risk. Uh, DVT involving iliac or femoral veins, uh, specifically iliac femoral DVTs are at the highest risk. Uh, age of 55, uh, history of more than one DVT leg, and then substantial uh, leg symptoms that persist after one month. Uh, the old school treatment for post thrombotic syndrome was leg elevation, avoiding long periods of standing or sitting compression stockings, weight loss, skin and ulcer care, but this isn't really uh, sufficient, uh, especially in cases of uh, severe post-thrombotic syndrome. And so uh, there's been a large push to kind of study and examine and see, is there anything that we can do to uh, clear thrombus and prevent the development of post-thrombotic syndrome? Uh, we see there's particular in patients uh, who have uh, acute iliofemoral disease with high thrombus burden. Uh, and the treatment options kind of broken down in addition to anticoagulation are thrombolysis, which I'll discuss in a second, aspiration, stenting, uh, and then surgical. Uh, systemic thrombolysis, you know, basically giving systemic TPA at the time of diagnosis, and this probably should never be done, uh, but initial studies demonstrated that there are uh, improved clearance of iliofrombal thrombus when compared to anticoagulation alone. Uh, and there is a reduction of development of post-thrombotic syndrome, but as you can imagine, giving systemic uh, TPA, uh, the risk is major bleeding and the risk of this far outweighs the reduction of uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, so then the next step was uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis, uh, injecting uh, TPA directly into the thrombus itself and uh, there is uh, significant success using that technique. Uh, but because you're using TPA, some of that does get absorbed into the, the system, even if it's targeted, and there is associated bleeding risk with that. Uh, we can see here 5 to 11% risk. Uh, there's a national venous registry looking at either femoral DVTs. And again, there is uh, improvement in clot burden and development of post thrombotic syndrome, but it requires uh, ICU and uh, stay and prolonged immobilization. Uh, and there's the risk of uh, bleeding and significant costs. So, not the ideal treatment. Uh, the CAVENT trial really looked at catheter directed thrombolysis and anticoagulation versus anticoagulation alone for proximal DVT, which is defined as femoral or iliofemoral DVT. And they found that there was indeed uh, an improvement in uh, the development of uh, post-thrombotic syndromes, lower with uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis, uh, but no real difference in quality of life when looking at the groups as a whole. When looking specifically in patients who had post-thrombotic syndrome or not, obviously, if they develop post-thrombotic syndrome, they have worse quality of life. So based on this trial, they found that catheter-directed thrombolysis was cost-effective, but there was still risk with bleeding. Uh, the next step in uh, you know, technological advancement, uh, probably within the last five to seven years, was uh, using uh, special catheters. This is the angiojet catheter, and it essentially uses very high pressure uh, um, kind of uh, fluid waves and the Bernoulli effect to blast thrombus with uh, TPA and uh, really get it into all the different parts of the thrombus itself, rather than just simply just injecting it toward the, the clot. Uh, and because of the kind of blast and pressure, as well as the TPA, it's called pharmacomechanical uh, thrombectomy. Uh, and we found that there's been uh, decreased ICU stays, more rapid resolution of uh, thrombus burden, uh, and uh, you know, significant improvement when using angiogen. The issue is you're still using TPA and, and there still are some risks with uh, bleeding as that TPA leaches into the system. And if anyone has ever taken care of a patient who's undergone uh, you know, angiogen thrombolysis, either in the arterial or in the venous 
system, you can see profound hypertension, you can see issues with uh, asystole and things like this because there can be significant hemolysis during the procedure itself. Uh, this is the angiojet system itself. You can see the catheters, a specialized catheter. There's a whole uh, kind of a device set up here and it really blasts that across the thrombus of the wire. You inject the uh, catheter into the middle of the thrombus and then you really spray the thrombus, break it up using this combination of the spray. And then also there's TPA delivered in that spray to get the thrombus all kind of mixed up in there. Uh, and again, there is significant risk of bleeding, and especially in ICU patients, a lot of the patients who would benefit most from removal of iliofemoral thrombus are the ones who have a, a strict or a relative contraindication to lytic therapy. You can see that listed there. Anyone who had any major abdominal surgery recently, any intracranial process um, is a, a contraindication. So there's been development to try to figure out what else we can do. Uh, aspiration thrombectomy, literally sucking the clot out. Uh, that's really been uh, picking up in the last five years with the development of different catheters or social images in a second, but it's essentially using a large bore catheter and sucking out thrombus. Uh, here's a case that I did. You can see in the images here, the pre-intervention intravascular ultrasound. There's a large amount of thrombus. Uh, and the vein looks quite small. Post after using this uh, system, the vein looks completely cleared. And this is the, some of the thrombus that we sucked out of uh, the iliofemoral uh, region there. This is a, a different device, a, a suction thrombectomy device that can, uh, again, suck. It's a 12 French uh, device that I've been using a lot to suck a lot of these iliofemoral DVTs with pretty good success. Again, you know, everything kind of has a downside. The downside to uh, using lytics bleeding, the downside to using some of these suction mechanical thrombectomy devices, as you can imagine, is as you clear more thrombus, you start sucking out some blood along with thrombus. And, you know, uh, I've had cases where, um, you know, you can have some significant blood loss while controlled can occur. Uh, this is the Nari clot retriever, which I've been using a lot recently. Uh, and we see it's essentially uh, a bag with a coring element that you deploy kind of high in the cava and bring down and scoop out all of this clot in the iliofemoral segment and pull it out of the body. Here you can see this is after one pull in a, a subacute uh, DVT case in the iliofemoral segment. And this is really picking up probably in the last three or four years uh, because it's been able to clear a lot of this uh, iliofemoral DVT in the acute or subacute or even chronic uh, timelines. This is a case here uh, that I did last week. Uh, we're going through a CT scan here, axial imaging. I want you to pay attention to the IVC. It looks open as we're going down. There's occlusive uh, DVT in the left common iliac vein, completely occlusive. And when you look in the right side, also the right kind of external iliac vein, there's a occlusive thrombus there as well. Patient came in complaining of fairly significant bilateral left worse than right uh, leg swelling. And so uh, I did this procedure again last week in the prone position. Oftentimes uh, I access the popliteal veins and they're pretty uh, compliant and able to take sheet sizes oftentimes up to 16 French. So this is, uh, you know, in the prone position, I access the popliteal veins bilaterally. That's the left and right side. I shot a venogram. You can see that there's severe thrombus burden uh, in bilateral popliteal veins here. You can see a lot of the collateral veins are filling. That's the only venous uh, kind of drainage that we see. And uh, this is that uh, thrombectomy case. That I use a clot retriever device here. Pulled out. This is just one pull, but we serially uh, kind of pull this out once for every quadrant. So four pulls on each side usually. Uh, cleared a significant amount of thrombus there. And this is the left and right side after. You can see, you know, all the contrast is going through the main deep femoral vein, popliteal vein. You no longer see any filling of the collaterals. That's because the path of least resistance now is the deep femoral vein, has the highest capacitance to, you know, uh, drain uh, all that uh, contrast 
subsequently the, the venous drainage. You see the same thing uh, on the, in the other leg. And then when looking at the central venous system, uh, again, we see some narrowing here, which may be the cause of developing this uh, DVT initially, but you see outflow out into the uh, IVC and up into the um, uh, cava. Uh, so pretty good case here. Patient uh, had the procedure and then on post-op day one, I had marked improvement of her leg swelling. This is in combination with compression stockings and she was discharged home on post-op day two on a doe. A uh, quick uh, bit about acute upper extremity DVTs. Uh, they account for uh, only 5% of all diagnosed DVTs. The risk of PE is much less in upper extremity DVTs. Uh, the primary causes we can see in either hypercoagulable state or some type of compression of the subclavian vein or axillary vein. Secondary causes, uh, oftentimes we see thrombus uh, around a central venous catheter uh, that subsequently propagates uh, to the peripheral segment. These patients can also develop post thrombotic syndrome and can be quite devastating, especially when it's in a patient in their dominant arm, especially if they're young. Uh, so this is another case that I did, I think, last month. Uh, 32-year-old male, history of Crohn's disease, so prothrombotic state, multiple abdominal operations, developed an intercutaneous fistula, essentially had a, a right basilic vein pick line, and presented with acute uh, one-day onset of severe right arm uh, pain and swelling. Uh, you know, his duplex demonstrated occlusive thrombus in the right subclavian, axillary, and basilic veins. So this is some uh, duplex images. You see the catheter in the middle of the subclavian and axillary vein. You see no flow in the vein at all. The vein is fully distended and filled uh, with thrombus. This is a, a CT scan that we got. You can see the IG is a little bit distended because of the uh, uh, thrombus there. You see the catheter going down the innominate vein and the SVC is all patent, but the subclavian and then following that catheter down the axillary and uh, the proximal basilic vein is all occluded. So I chose to use uh, uh, one of those suction thrombectomy uh, devices. This is the CAT-12 uh, penumbra suction thrombectomy device in this case. Uh, you can see here that even though it's only a 12 French catheter, you know, I twist it around so I can really clear as much thrombus as possible. These are some images. So that's the diagnostic venogram. You see filling of a lot of collaterals because the main axillary vein is thrombosed, the subclavian vein is thrombosed. And then the central venogram here, you see filling of collaterals into the contralateral side. And if you look very closely, you see faint filling of the SVC draining into the heart, but you don't see uh, direct flow. You see that I have a, a wire across all this thrombus already, and this is my initial diagnostic uh, venogram before treatment. Then I pass my suction thrombectomy device, and uh, this is the venogram after. We still see some filling of the collateral, so it's not perfect, but you do see the main uh, lumen, the main axillary vein, and the main subclavian vein have been significantly cleared, and you see emptying into the SVC and into the heart. So this patient came in on a Sunday, on a Saturday night. I did this procedure Sunday morning. Uh, and discharged the patient home Sunday night on a DOAC, saw him two weeks post-op, and he had complete resolution of all symptoms. Again, this is pre, this is post, and you can make the argument that it's uh, much, much better uh, angiographically. But, you know, the patient uh, did really, really well. Uh, you know, this is a, a young case of a young patient who developed uh, symptomatic DVT in his uh, dominant arm. And probably 10 years ago, the treatment would have just been anticoagulation alone. He probably would have developed post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, he would have had, um, you know, it would have been a significant morbidity in this young patient, but he essentially had a two-day hospital stay, had a minimally invasive percutaneous uh, intervention, uh, and went home after two days in the hospital with complete resolution of his symptoms. This is uh, another case in a much older patient. Uh, I think I did this three weeks ago. Uh, this is the pre-intervention upper extremity venogram on top. You can see just wisps of contrast around this large uh, thrombus burden. You can make out the outline of the vein, but the majority of the vein is occupied by thrombus. And 
you know, this was three months old. So the likelihood of clearing all this was quite low. I, I told that to the patient up front, but she had such severe symptoms and swelling in her arm. Again, this was her dominant arm, the left arm. Uh, and, you know, we can see here again, the uh, completion venogram after using one of those suction thrombectomy devices. We don't see feeling of any collaterals. We see inline flow, not, the, not perfect, but the patient did have a significant uh, symptom resolution uh, on post-op day one. So really, uh, in uh, conclusion, you know, DVT is very common, becoming diagnosed even more frequently as we have uh, you know, point of care ultrasound access. Uh, we talk about a little bit prophylaxis in terms of mechanical and pharmacologic. Uh, but the real point that I wanted to drive home here is uh, why do we, or who do we treat in terms of, um, you know, things more than just anticoagulation and why? The reason we do that is uh, we've uh, seen in the outpatient setting uh, or long-term uh, when managing DVTs, specifically DVTs in the iliofemoral segment or the subclavian and axillary segment, patients go on to develop post-thrombotic syndrome uh, more than half of the time. And that can be associated with significant morbidity as well. Uh, and we've developed some of these newer kind of minimally invasive endovascular techniques to clear a lot of that thrombus burden and prevent uh, a lot of patients from developing post-thrombotic syndrome. So, you know, I've only been in attending here for about five months, but I've already done probably 15 to 16 cases of these, all with fairly good success. There's a, a fairly big body of literature that's growing, demonstrating the utility of some of these uh, minimally invasive uh, techniques in patients who are candidates. So, uh, you know, this is uh, my cell phone number, my office number. If you guys ever have a DVT uh, and you need uh, to call vascular, feel free to, to call or text me. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Justin, thank you so much. That was really an impressive, great overview. Um, do you, you just do peripheral vascular uh, IR is still mainly doing the PE stuff or do you do any of the PEs or is that just? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the technology and uh, recent developments in terms of uh, aspiration thrombectomy and mechanical thrombectomy uh, really stems because there was a big need for that for PE interventions, minimally invasive PE interventions. And uh, at least at our hospital, our IR team has made a big push and they're pretty good at, at treating a lot of these PEs. They still treat uh, those PEs. I don't do anything uh, with the pulmonary emboli, emboli, but those same technologies have had great success in treating uh, the more um, still central but peripheral segments like caval DVTs or iliofemoral DVTs. Um, what is what is your approach to the morbidly obese and also the patients of hypercoagulability due to malignancy? Um, is there special ways to handle them? Because they're generally much more difficult to manage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the morbid obesity, especially with some of those other comorbidities, put them at significantly high risk of developing DBT. I will say uh, in patients uh, who have been consulted on with uh, DBT, who are morbidly obese, uh, because everything is, you know, percutaneous, minimally invasive, there's no significant wound, no additional morbidity or mortality from uh, these minimally invasive procedures to clear uh, central venous thrombus. Uh, but when you have something like, um, you know, I've had cases where patients have severe malignancy and, and uh, lymph nodes that are compressing iliac veins that subsequently cause thrombosis and things like this. Uh, <laughs> patients specifically don't necessarily benefit uh, as much because even if you clear the thrombus burden, you can't really do anything uh, about the external compression from malignancy from lymph nodes or things like this. You can't really stent uh, against a, a um, external compression or anything like that. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, morbidly obese patients that develop uh, iliofemoral DVTs, no real change in the algorithm uh, for me. How long do you anticoagulate the, the morbidly obese? I think, uh, you know, that's um, an interesting question. I think, uh, you know, <laughs> In terms of if it's a provoked or unprovoked DVT, 
think we still stick to those same guidelines, knowing that they do have a higher risk of recurrence. In patients who have an unprovoked DVT who are morbidly obese, I would still do you know three months of anticoagulation. And I'd probably follow them up in the office to, to you know duplex them to determine if there's thrombus resolution or not, and probably cater their anticoagulation regimen like that. Um, Seems to me if you can't reverse the causes of DVT, you need to continue treatment with probably more oversight, but I haven't seen any studies doing that because, you know, if you can't get rid of what's causing it, then how can you make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah, it's good. I, I mean, it's true, you know, <laughs> when you have patients who are morbidly obese that develop these DVT, even if they're quote unquote unprovoked, three months of anticoagulation is not changing, you know, the fact that they are still morbidly obese. Yeah. It's just a difficult study because it's difficult to anticoagulate someone with no other risk factor for life, right? Um, but, you know, I think at least what I would do is I follow patients uh, in the office. And if I still see that there is still thrombus after three months, which oftentimes there is, I usually continue um, anticoagulation and follow them with repeat ultrasound until there is complete thrombus resolution. How long is the longest that you've seen before the thrombus resolves? Is it? I, you know, I, I've only been, this is my first year of uh, practice as an attending. So uh, I'll get back to you and let you know the longest uh, that I've had. I've had uh, my partner, uh, Dr. Tadras has had patients who, you know, he's uh, anticoagulated for a year and if they still have thrombus burden if it's stable then it's really weighing the risks of anticoagulation versus the benefit in this mm. case patient-centered well thank you dr george if anyone else has any questions uh, i'll leave the floor open if not i'll give a run back 10 minutes at the end of uh, the conference Okay, thank you so much, Justin. And uh, remember everyone, we have PSQ at two o'clock.